Welcome to the University of Kentucky Department of Anesthesiology YouTube channel. Topic today is eyes and anesthesia. Specifically, it is a keyword review based upon the last decade of American Board of Anesthesia published keywords on the topic of eyes and anesthesia. Those keywords are represented here and in green are the keywords on the in-training exam from the American Board of Anesthesia in 2019. This is published and distributed to all who have taken the exam and to programs. Keywords in, uh, at the top left focus on things like intraocular pressure, the effects of some of our anesthetics on intraocular pressure, on injected gas bubbles like sulfur hexafluoride, uh, drugs that we manage post-operative nausea and vomiting with and how it can affect glaucoma. Scopolamine would be the example of that. Blindness after surgery and why a person might be blind after surgery with a focus on ischemic optic neuropathy as being one of the top causes of post-operative blindness. Reflexes such as the oculocardiac reflex and the corneal reflex and then blocks of the eye, including retro and peribulbar blocks and some of their effects. Let's go into intraocular pressure first. Normal is about 10 to 22 millimeters of mercury, and some things can decrease it, such as our intravenous anesthetics, propofol, etomidate, uh, our inhaled anesthetics, hyperventilation, getting a little cool, decreasing the blood pressure or the central venous pressure. All those things can decrease intraocular pressure. Some things can increase the intraocular pressure. Succinylcholine does it transiently, and even if you defasciculate with, for example, rock uranium, the intraocular pressure still can rise um, with succinylcholine administration. This does not mean that it's necessarily contraindicated, even in open eye injuries, if it's necessary for immediate neuromuscular blockade, uh, where succinylcholine uh, can be administered and the risk of extrusion of the vitreous is extremely low. Ketamine also can increase intraocular pressure, causes nystagmus also. Valsalva, pressure on the eyeball, coughing, vomiting. Some of the worst things to raise intraocular pressure is if a patient is light and bucks, uh, if they valsalva, cough, vomit, this can raise intraocular pressure 30 to 40 or even more millimeters of mercury. Raising the carbon dioxide, low oxygen levels, increased central venous pressure, and mean arterial pressure can also raise intraocular pressure. Intravenous and inhaled agents, as previously discussed, in general decrease intraocular pressure with the exception being ketamine, which causes nystagmus and blepharospasm. And as that eyeball is moving back and forth inside and blood flow probably goes up to the eyeball, um, the intraocular pressure can rise. Nitrous oxide, if the ophthalmologic surgeon has injected a gas such as sulfur hexafluoride into the back of the eyeball, and this is done occasionally after retinal detachment surgery, a picture is shown here of a gas bubble tamponading where the break in the retina occurred, that sulfur hexafluoride hangs around for quite a long time and it is recommended that if a patient requires general anesthesia within a four to six week period after injection of a sulfur hexafluoride bubble, that nitrous oxide should be avoided. Nitrous oxide would go into that gas bubble, expand it, and raise the pressure in the back of the eyeball. Succinylcholine, uh, we know increases intraocular pressure and does it very temporarily. Um, some of our other drugs can cause problems, and atropine and scopolamine uh, can cause acute angle closure glaucoma in susceptible patients. Now glaucoma can be of the uh, angle closure variant, and there's other variants. The angle closure variant is represented at the top right picture, where if you look at the uh, angle which separates the anterior chamber and the posterior chamber, and you see the little canal of Schlem where fluid uh, leaves and circulates outward, and at the outer part of the iris, that drainage angle, we want to keep that drainage angle open. And if the iris is pulled back like a curtain, for example, in a dilated pupil that scopolamine could cause or atropine could cause, 
that iris folds back and can fold back and actually uh, obstruct that drainage angle and cause acute angle closure glaucoma in patients that are susceptible. So if someone had postoperative nausea and vomiting who also had glaucoma, it probably be a, a bad idea to put a scopolamine patch on them uh, or use it in the postoperative period. Topical eye medications. If a patient with eye disease is taking topical medications, just realize that they can be absorbed and drugs like beta blockers uh, can be absorbed and cause bradycardia and bronchospasm. Phenylephrine can be absorbed and increase the blood pressure. And there's one called echothiophate that some glaucoma patients take as a topical eye medication. That medication irreversibly inhibits the enzyme that breaks down pseudocholine, that is succinylcholine, and it's called pseudocholinesterase, the enzyme. So if echothiophate is irreversibly inhibiting that enzyme, and you give succinylcholine, you can have a long effect uh, paralysis from succinylcholine. Mivacurium also, although that's mainly from historical uh, uh, discussion. So any medication you put in the eye can be absorbed. Another one is diamox or acetazolamide, which can be used also for glaucoma. And it is a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor. When it inhibits carbonic anhydrase, a patient urinates bicarbonate and you can get a metabolic acidosis. So if someone's taking Diamox and you happen to draw a blood gas and you see a metabolic acidosis, that may be the explanation for their metabolic acidosis. Postoperative ocular complications. The first one is corneal abrasion, and the picture at the top right shows staining, a stain used, uh, and you can see that the scratch is right there on the cornea. This could be a patient who, for example, you didn't tape their eyes shut before you intubated, intubated them, happened to lean across them and rub on their eyeball and maybe didn't even realize it. Robotic uh, surgery where patients in steep Trendelenburg, sometimes if it goes on for a long period of time and many fluids are administered, the eyes can get a little bit swollen, the eyelids that is, and pull apart and you can get a corneal abrasion. So poor taping shut of the eyes, the patient in the recovery room complains of eye pain. Usually it's on one side, unilateral. They tear and they're, when the lights are on, it bothers them. They have photophobia and it hurts when they blink. This, if it's diagnosed with a fluorescein stain like such here, uh, you would tape their eyes shut. In about 24 hours, the epithelium would grow back over. And in general, this is not a major complication except that it's quite painful. Central retinal artery occlusion is the next postoperative ocular complication. A patient prone with pressure on their eyeball would be a setup for this. And the way it would look in the fundus exam would be at the bottom right. And you see that cherry spot characteristic of central retinal artery occlusion. Their eyeball tends to be proptotic, chemotic, hyphemia is, hyphema is present, lid bruising with pale edematous retina, cherry red spot classic after head and neck surgery. So if patient's been prone uh, or had head and neck surgery and they can't see well, think of central retinal artery occlusion and that's what it would look like in the back of their eye. Cortical blindness is an occipital lesion. So it's the brain itself that has been damaged in some way, often a watershed infarction. That is an area of the brain at risk for low blood pressure, low cardiac output states, Cardiopulmonary bypass is one of those. A patient undergoes cardiopulmonary bypass, cardiac surgery, and their blood pressure is low for an extended period of time. They wake up uh, with bilateral blindness uh, with a normal optic disc and pupillary response, but they just can't see. It's a problem with the occipital lobe, not the eye or the eye nerves themselves. And then acute angle closure glaucoma, which we discussed briefly before when we were talking about avoiding scopolamine or atropine for PONV prophylaxis in patients with this because if that angle is closed off, the fluid builds up in the eye, the pressure then builds up in the eye, the canella schlem outflow is blocked often by the folding back of that curtain of the iris and the eyeball gets really high pressure. It looks like a dead eyeball. And so if you're called to the recovery room, someone's received uh, a anticholinergic 
medication, atropine or scopolamine. Remember that glycoparlate does not cross blood-brain barrier and does not cause pupillary changes. So it would be atropine or scopolamine, and they have this dead eyeball appearance. Think this could be acute angle closure glaucoma. Perioperative blindness, ischemic optic neuropathy is right at the top of the causes of perioperative blindness. It can be unilateral or bilateral. A patient wakes up with painless visual loss, often after a spine surgery on the back or neck, prolonged, hours long, and often prone. It can be of the anterior variant or the posterior ischemic optic neuropathy variant. If it's the anterior variant where the most anterior part of the optic nerve is ischemic, you can look in the back of their eye and they can, an ophthalmologist, probably not myself, but an ophthalmologist could see an optic disc edema present as opposed to posterior ischemic optic neuropathy farther back on that nerve, the optic disc itself uh, may appear normal, but the nerve is damaged more uh, back farther from the uh, back of the eye and so you don't see any changes when you look with your uh, fundal exam. Risks of ischemic optic neuropathy being prone, big long spine procedures, large blood loss, male sex obesity, and there's recommendations that we mix some colloids in with our crystalloids to maintain intravascular volume. There is no specific transfusion threshold where, for example, their hemoglobin's eight, and because of this risk, we should transfuse them. That's not true. There is no transfusion threshold uh, for us to trigger a transfusion just because of this specific risk. We should check and make sure that the head is kept in a neutral position and avoid the head being down below the heart. Um, and if someone wakes up with either bilateral or unilateral blindness after spine surgery, this would be right at the top of the list. Next topic is oculocardiac reflex, which is a cranial nerve 510 reflex. At the top shows that reflex. If there's tugging, for example, on the extraocular muscles, um, several ganglions are involved, but mainly it's the five cranial nerve that we want to talk about, which carries this signal to the brainstem, and then the 10th cranial nerve takes it back to the heart. So the afferent limb is trigeminal, the efferent limb is the uh, vagus nerve, and what happens is when the vagus nerve stimulates the heart, Brady dysrhythmias and hypotension and even asystole can occur when the eyeball is tugged on or pressure on the eyeball. So not just traction on the extraocular muscles like during eye muscle surgery in kids, but even doing a retrobulbar block where you inject some local in the back of their eye or put a pressure on the front of their eye uh, uh, can cause this reflex. Remember, it's afferent is the fifth cranial nerve, efferent is the 10th cranial nerve, and the response is bradycardia. Of note, the corneal reflex, another type of reflex, where if you touch the cornea, for example, with a Q-tip, the person should blink. And the sensation in the cornea is the fifth cranial nerve, and the blink is the orbicularis oculi, which is supplied by the seventh cranial nerve. So differentiate these, oculocardiac, 510, corneal, 5-7. Now this oculocardiac reflex aggravates, uh, is aggravated when the person is under light anesthesia or hypoxic or hypercarbic. It tends to fatigue easily, meaning if you kept pulling on that eyeball over time, it tends not to be such a problem. Um, by giving prophylactic anticholinergic agents in the preoperative period, you can't all the time block it. So it's not really recommended that you give someone IV atropine or IM atropine preoperatively to try to prevent this. If it occurs and it's really bad, the patient's severely bradycardic, you can tell the surgeon to stop pulling on the eyeball and uh, you may need to give atropine intravenously to speed the heart rate back up. Remove the stimulus, deepen anesthesia, anticholinergics, and infiltration of local anesthesia of the extraocular muscles can be used if it's a problem as you're operating. The last key word in eyes in anesthesia is retrobulbar versus peribulbar block. Retrobulbar refers to the fact that the needle during injection is behind the eyeball, and the picture at the top right represents a needle coming in and being directed behind the eyeball, um, and it penetrates the extraocular muscle cone 
uh, and it's very deep. And so you can imagine if you're injecting deep behind the eyeball, you go through the extraocular muscle that you could cause injury to the optic nerve. You could even perforate the globe like a beach ball uh, and uh, deflate it. You can hit blood vessels and cause a retrobulbar hemorrhage, which over time will push the eyeball forward. Um, and that is often the way it is diagnosed. And you can even cause the oculocardiac reflex with bradycardia ensuing. Although rare, a subdural or subarachnoid injection can occur because as you inject a local anesthetic near the covering of that optic nerve, it can spread through the nerve sheath all the way back to the brainstem. And so even a very small amount of local anesthesia going back to the brainstem can put the brainstem basically to sleep for a short period of time and you stop breathing and can become very hypotensive. So if a patient's awake and very lightly sedated, let's say with 25 uh, 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 mics of fentanyl or 50 mics of fentanyl, and uh, you do the injection, and all of a sudden they just stop breathing and become very hypotensive, you must think that this complication of local anesthesia tracking down that optic nerve sheath to the brainstem uh, and putting the brainstem to sleep, stopping respirations, causing vasodilation. Uh, and uh, if you just simply give positive pressure ventilation, a little blood pressure support, this goes away quite quickly. Now, retrobulbar block sometimes is combined with a seventh nerve block if you don't want the person to be able to squint. And that will get the orbicularis oculi muscle. And so not only will they numb in the eye, but they can't squeeze their orbicularis oculi which could get in the way of surgery. And now a peribulbar block is shown in the bottom right. Peribulbar meaning around the eyeball, and you can see that the needle does not penetrate the extraocular muscles. It is superficial to those extraocular muscles where the injection occurs. So there's less chance of a retrobulbar bleed hitting a blood vessel back behind the eyeball or hitting the optic nerve. You have to inject more local and it takes a longer for the onset of the block uh, to set up, but uh, you can see why peribulbar could have some advantages with a lower rate of complications like the bleeding behind the eyeball, injuring the um, optic nerve, or tracking back along the optic nerve and anesthetizing the brainstem. So our key words over the last decade of eyes and anesthesia, um, we have things about blindness, we have our drugs and their effect on intraocular pressure. We talked about glaucoma and scopolamine and acute angle closure glaucoma. We talked about nitrous oxide and avoiding it with sulfur hexafluoride gas uh, when it's been used in the past. And lastly, we finished up with retrobulbar and peribulbar blocks where the needle ends up and some of the complications, including the fact that a retrobulbar block could have major hemodynamic effects if it tracked back along that optic nerve sheath and anesthetized the brainstem. This ends this short keyword presentation on the keywords related to the eyes. And I just want to remind you that anesthesia is awesome, never stop learning. This picture is from the French Alps, September of 2019, where I had the opportunity to climb the Col de la Madeleine which is a, a beautiful climb in the French Alps. I hope you have a wonderful day.